I'm Robert Cavuto, and today on Metal Rules, we're speaking with Pyre Sundstrom of Sabaton to talk about the band's upcoming North American tour starting on 9-15 in Seattle. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, and uh, I'm excited uh, as hell, you know. Tomorrow we start in Seattle. Chances. Yeah, that's great. You know, my editor of Metal Rules and I were talking, and uh, we think that when the Judas Priest and the Iron Maidens retire, that Sabaton is going to be right there replacing the old guard. What's your plans for world domination at that point? Well, we will see. I mean, first of all, I don't want to see them retire, uh, even if eventually well, all things will have to do that, including us as well someday as well, hopefully in a long time in the future. But um, so now, I mean, uh, we we don't focus so much on what others are doing. You know, we focus on what Sabaton is doing and uh, we're doing pretty well at the moment. We are growing and growing and growing, and playing for as much people as possible. And uh, let's see who, who's going to be. I mean, I, I just have a hope, you know, that there will be somebody to take over uh, when uh, when the, some of these bands retire and that I hope that there is some new bands taking over. If we are one of them, I'll be happy and uh, I'll, I'll do what we can to make sure that we are. But, you know, we will see. It's also up to the audience to decide that. You always put out great music, so you're going to be right there, in my personal opinion and my editor's opinion. <laughs> So you guys, um, you guys got a little disappointed. You guys were out with Judas Priest a few years ago, cut the tour short. Tell me about the decision to come back to North America with your own headlining tour. Yeah, I mean, that, that decision was already there. We, we already had these dates when we were on tour with Judas Priest. And uh, we, we just wanted, you know, that tour to, um, to, to, you know, we wanted that tour to work out as good as possible. And uh, unfortunately, it didn't. Um, but gladly enough, uh, Richie is back on track and he's playing again. So, um, but we, we already had the plan to come as a headliner. And um, uh, obviously, everything got a little bit delayed with the COVID situation and uh, things like that. We got an album out and uh, we waited for the right moment. I think the as good as it can be in these strange times, this was the right moment to go on the tour. Good, good, yeah. We're excited to see you. I'm hoping to come and see you out when you come to Philadelphia. You're welcome. I'm on the East Coast, so Philly's kind of close. You know, um, how, do you, how do you keep yourself satisfied with touring for so many years? Uh, something that could be so routine, how do you keep it fresh? I think it's never routine for Sabaton. Uh, I mean, we, we have so many different places around the world uh, and uh, partly it's like we, we also rotate the set list. We come to places where some songs are more popular than others and we kind of follow that. But we also, um, the, the different size in production venues, the circumstances, uh, there's so many different things that, uh, you know, makes impact on our show that no show is the same. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, you know, you, you, you learn and people say, how is the audience in, in the United States? Well, the United States is a pretty big place, you know, <laughs> it's kind of difficult to answer that question. Uh, you know, it, it's like uh, it's so many different people everywhere. But when, when, when it all comes down, yes, it's a good. Yeah, it's great. It's awesome. You know, we, we love playing wherever we go. And uh, every night is a new night and every night is different. Yeah, you're playing in Philadelphia. It's called the Fillmore. It's a great venue. I just saw Anthrax and Black Label Society there. So it's a huge venue with uh, a great big stage. So you guys are nice. going to well on it. Yeah. You know, how long does it take you guys to get situated or up to speed when you're rehearsing and preparing for a tour of this this epic proportions? And we we had this. I mean, we had the spring. We started in Sweden. We did uh, 30 shows in Sweden uh, mm -hmm. in a row. And uh, then we had a summer tour with about 20 festivals and headline shows in Europe. So we are kind of, you know, we're, we're in a quite good, uh, uh, quite good uh, routine at the moment. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I think that, you know, uh, we we are in good mood. We we don't really need to. Uh, there there was no need for us to get up to speed before this run. We are already 
so well played, you know, uh, yeah. since, since that shows. Um, the, the past months we already did of about 50, 60 shows. So we're, we're quite good. Um, but yes, before those, there were some issues. I, 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 I'd be stupid if I say not. After these long times of no shows, yes, we were nervous. We're happy that we had the shows in Sweden to start with, but when we came to Graspop and there's suddenly 80,000 people in the audience or something like that, and you know, we're headlining and ending a, such a show, then yes, then it was a little bit of nerves coming in. Like, how guys do we do we really know how to do this? Yeah. Uh, but it, that that worked out great as well. So all, all in all, I'm now we are very confident, and uh, th I think that that's when Sabaton is the most happy. Uh, we are um, we are uh, confident in what we are playing, but we are excited to to show that we are better than than what people think we are. And I think that's where we are at the moment. Yeah, you guys are seasoned professionals, so it's it's probably very easy for you guys to get up to speed and get that confidence level back to normal. Uh, with some things. <laughs> when you are when you are playing in front in a festival in front of eighty thousand people, you're on the edge of the stage, looking out over the people, over the crowd. What's it like looking at eighty thousand screaming people? Um, you know. It, it sounds a little bit weird to say, but it's just people. Um, and uh, you don't know them and you don't know what they do and you don't know how they look like and you don't know how they act and you don't really uh, know if they are enjoying the show. Mm. You, 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 there's only so many you can see. It's why I prefer to play in a theater, you know, like when, when you're looking at a 2000 seater uh, theater or something like that, that's the perfect because there's, you, you can see that there's nobody watching the cell phone, there's nobody fighting, there's nobody doing that. You, you have the whole audience, in the, uh, you see each and every one of them, and you feel them. And I think that that's the optimal uh, experience. And uh, after that, I mean, there, there are some venues where you can scale it from 2,000 maybe to 4,000 or something like that, but still feel everybody inside depending on how the layout of the venue is. But somewhere around there, it just starts to get people and then shitloads of people. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, of course, it's nice and it sounds amazing. You know, you, 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 you're listening to the audience and it sounds amazing. And, and it's like, or, or you see the arena and you see you're surrounded by people. It's, it's a magical feeling. But I do still prefer uh, the theater. I still prefer that. The American theaters, they are something special. They, for me, they are perfectly built uh, to enjoy the atmosphere and see each person, you know. That's true. That's great. Um, how much flexibility do you have in changing up the songs night from night? We, we do have some flexibility. Um, we often decide some things last minute. So uh, there, there is a lot of things that are set. And uh, depending on, on the size of the show, we, we need to be a little bit more in advance. I mean, we have uh, crew members in, in, if we are playing not in the theaters where we cannot use it, but if we are playing open air shows and stuff like that in Europe where we have the full pyrotechnical production, then we need to kind of give a heads up to the people because it takes quite a lot of time to rig everything and bring yes. us the, the stuff. So then, then we need to tell them in advance what we are planning to do. Um, but um, you know, it, it gives a little opportunities for some improvisation even there. Great. You know, you're one of the few bands I think could go out there and play the deeper cuts off earlier albums um, and people would love it. Is there any, do you have any set list in mind that you're gonna be playing in the United States and maybe some of the deeper cuts? We, at the moment, uh, we, we have some ideas about the set list, but I think that the, the show that we're gonna do in Seattle is gonna be some differences from the show that we're gonna do in New York when we end this tour. So uh, I think along the road, we're gonna feel how it works, feel the audience and do changes, updates. That's how we usually do. Oh, okay. So we set out, so uh, Seattle and Portland's gonna be our guinea pigs in the beginning and then uh, then, then we, we, we take it from there. Is there any songs that still make the hair on your arm stand up when you play them? Uh, 
still. I mean, uh, one of my favorites to play now, that's uh, Dreadnought, but that's from the new album. So um, I think that one has this feeling like, damn, this is so good. Uh, but what else is there out there? Like, I don't know. Uh, mm. We we will see what, yeah. Okay. I, I love to play Christmas Truths. It's something special. That's great. That's good to know. You know, uh, your new CD, War to End All Wars, um, is furious and infectious. It's a great CD. Would you ever consider doing a full show of just that entire album? I, I know Maiden has done that in the past. Would you guys ever consider doing something like that? We did. Uh, I mean, we did the full uh, Carole Frex album. We did it, uh, actually, uh, the Carole Frex is a concept album about a Swedish king. Uh, obviously named Carolus Rex, and uh, he he died in Norway in a, during a siege of a fortress there. And we actually played on that fortress on the 300 years anniversary, and we played a full show, and we had uh, actors and things like that on the stage too. Um, and, and yeah, that was, uh, we, we did that. But we also did on the Sabaton Open Air some years ago, we played the full album, The Art of War, as a concept from start to end. Um, we have done that. Uh, so we, we've done a couple of things similar to that in the past, and it works. Um, but I, I think it's more fun when we do, we just play songs. No, that's great. That's great. You know, in 2012, you guys had some major lineup changes. How did you guys overcome that? You seem to be a very resilient band. Mm, yeah, well, a lot of people said that that's not going to work out. You're never going to walk through this, but um, but it worked. I mean, I think that uh, a lot of the, the fans understood that in the core, uh, there was Joachim who writes most of the music and me being a lot of the, the driving force behind the band. So um, I, I think that most of the fans understood that this might work anyway. And uh, we, we proved that it worked. Um, and we went on. And we no. Up. no, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, is there a secret for like new members to win over the audience and the fans? Because some bands do it very well. Kiss does it well. Judas Priest did it well with Richie. Other bands, you know, don't do it so well. It doesn't. It doesn't connect. So, what's the secret to that? Uh, you know, um, you you can't really. You you can always let's say. Um, prepare your fans for something and you know guys this is great you're gonna love this guy uh, but in the end it's the judgment of the fans and uh, that's just up to that person but before it becomes that person's job it is our job to to you know speak with that person who's gonna jump step into a band or I mean our or you know any bands um, to make a decision that is this good for, for the band you know, and uh, maybe it's good for me personally, but what's the fans gonna think about this? And uh, I don't want to say any names, but there is plenty of bands out there that I think definitely did not pay a single attention to that when they brought in band members and uh, they were not listening to their fans. And then um, uh, obviously in the end, they're gonna get the judgment and uh, yeah. We, we didn't do that. We listened to our fans. No, I think that's great. I, I do agree with you that there are certain bands, big and small, didn't work out, didn't listen. So I totally get it. And you're also like the Rod Smallwood of uh, Sabaton. You're the, man the manager of the band and you do all the promotion and you handle so much. Tell me a bit about that role and responsibility on top of writing, recording and being on stage. It's got to be a huge undertaking. Yeah, yes, sure it is. Um, but it kind of grow on me, you know. It starts out, you're, you know, I, I wanted to play in a band. That's it. And then uh, you realize that uh, uh, no, why is nobody doing that? Somebody needs to do that. And then you undertake that. And then you realize somebody needs to do that. And somebody needs to do that. And uh, in the end, you become pretty good at it, you know, because you know what you really want yourself. And you are directly the person uh, uh, they said. Over the years, it becomes quite convenient, you know, nobody's telling us what to do, it's ourselves. We, we have a tight, close, you know, relationship and we say we want to do something, nobody's in our way, we just do it. 
and um, uh, I'm quite happy with uh, how it looks like. And um, yeah, I met a lot of uh, managers around the world, and I, um, I mean, it, it's quite easy to say that you know you you it's difficult for somebody else to love your baby as much as you do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this is our thing and uh, we love it a lot and we are a little bit afraid to put it in the hands of somebody else, to, to be honest. And, uh, um, and so far we are doing pretty well. Yeah, you read, I read a lot of autobiographies and there's so many bands out there that have gotten ripped off by their managers and taken advantage of or just really not taken them to the heights. You've actually... So I guess it's your baby and you've taken it to incredible heights and you've really created a tremendous market for your brand of music and your style of war themed music. So kudos to you on that. I mean, we, it was, uh, um, yeah, we, we have an idea to own everything ourselves and do, do things ourselves. I guess it's a little bit in the Swedish mentality, you know, do it yourself uh, mentality of, of mm -hmm. the Swedish population. Um, we, we grew up, and both me and the singer Joachim, we had the same kind of thing. Nobody's gonna do it for you, you know. Do it yeah. yourself. And then um, when you when you do something yourself, you also have a sense of pride that it feels better, you know. I, I, I never wanted anything for free in my life. I hate it. I never want to get anything for free. I, I think it doesn't taste good. It doesn't feel good. It's uh, I, I don't like when somebody gives something or, or you know, offers something. And um, maybe it's also a, a bit of a uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know, paranoia that somebody wants something back. I mean, I know that there are nice people who just want to give something in, the, in this world as well. But um, but, but I, I, I tend to see that there is an, a second thought behind it. So, you know, I am quite happy. We What we have done, uh, it's, it's up to us, you know, and it can't fall that easy, you know. Um, it's all resting on us, and uh, I think that that's the strongest foundation there is. Uh, we own all the rights to everything. We, there is nobody who owns the merchandise rights, the label rights, the music rights, the publishing rights. We own it all. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we decide we want to do something, nobody's going to be in our way. That's fantastic. That's a great mentality. I like that. I, I want to be respectful to your time, and uh, thank you so much for speaking with me today it was so exciting and i'm looking forward to seeing you guys and i wish you the best of luck on the tour starting out tomorrow which is incredible thank you try and thank get some you. sleep <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, i'm first gonna try to stay up that's my thing so i can get some good sleep at the right time and not seven o'clock in the evening so first of all i have to stay up and then i get some good sleep but uh, before then i have a couple of more interviews and i got a little bit more to do uh, and uh, to, to, I haven't actually met all of, all of the people yet. So they, they've been coming in. Most of the, everybody came in yesterday, except for a few that had flights uh, delays. So I'm going to meet with some of our crew members today. Great. Well, best of luck to you. And thank you so much for your time. It was a really insightful interview. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Be have safe. A have a great time. You too. Bye-bye.